Thank you, John. I had told John when he was getting his introduction that I feel, felt inept and unaccomplished when I listened to him, uh, what he has done. So that's wonderful. Thank you very much for that nice introduction. Hello. That's good. Even at, even at six, you still can say hello back. That's good. Um, I'm delighted to be here, and, and it's quite a privilege to be able to uh, talk with you tonight about nonprofits, which, as John said, is my, my personal passion and my family passion. Uh, many challenges uh, for the sector, and so let's, let's talk through some, some things that, uh, for those of you that are interested in the sector, you may already know or have thought out, and I hope I can just bend your brain just a little bit about uh, the, the sector and what it, its challenges are and how we are going to, uh, to, to move ahead. Because as, as, uh, as uh, John said, when things are good, things are good for nonprofits. When things are bad, things are more important for nonprofits uh, in, in our communities. Uh, this is some contact information for me if you have questions after tonight. We're, you know, we're going to have a time during this for extensive time for question and answer, but if you think of your question in a week or two or three, here's how to get a hold of me. Um, the key here is really for the sector of, of what's going to happen. When I began consulting and training in nonprofits in the early 80s, uh, there were two undergraduate programs for nonprofit management in the United States. One was at Case Western in Cleveland, one was at Yale. There are now over 140 to 50 undergraduate and graduate programs. There are countless certificate programs, a uh, huge amount of research, huge amount of, uh, of resources for the nonprofit sector, all of which is great. But where do we go from here? Well, first of all, the sector, which comprises about 11% of the gross domestic product, about 11% of, uh, of employment in the United States, um, has a pr heavy dependence on government funding. While some organizations, uh, like the organization I'm, I'm here today to work with, Ronald McDonald House of, of Arkansas, or Karen Aaron is sitting in the back there, um, get very little, if no government funding. Many nonprofits are heavily dependent on government funding, and as all of you know, the government funding is fine, right? They're balancing their budgets, there's not a big problem, and as a result, State governments, federal governments, city governments, county governments uh, across the country are asking nonprofits to do more with less. So what I tell people is that we, we are in the nonprofit world, not on our own, like nobody else is going to help us, but we are not going to see a return to the, the pre-Reagan era of ability to pay for services fully again. We are going to have to figure out uh, other ways to provide, to provide the services that we do. Second, those of us who are my generation, the boomers, hit 60, 65, 70, and say, sayonara, oh, and where's my check? A tremendous amount of the government funding argument that's going on in Washington right now is about us. It's about Medicare and Medicaid, right? And, and, and Social Security, and how do we pay for that? And how do we, we will sort of suck that as we, as we go out, of the, out, the, out the door. The good news is for nonprofits generally is that we are still very engaged at the management level, at the board level, at the volunteer level, and we continue to be. And about 60,000 boomers every quarter leave the for-profit government or military world and come to the nonprofit sector to do something of what they say of value, what we say of value. Uh, we all believe that we saved the world in the 60s and we want to do it again. Uh, we are all collectively delusional. We all think we saved uh, the world. We all thought we were, we, if you ask any boomer, we were all at Woodstock, all 80 million of us. You know, it, was, it was very wet and muddy, and there were lots of us. It was kind of, anyway, we, we will provide both good news and bad news to the sector as we sort of move on to our next, next engagement. Um, more demand for services is, a, all of us know that there are more people accessing more services but what you may not know is that over the last 15 years, the cost per person, particularly in the human services, absent healthcare now, but in mental health, in child welfare, uh, developmental disabilities, uh, it has gone up dramatically. So that while I might be serving, you know, all the people here in the front row, there are seven chairs, the, the, the cost per person, in addition, is higher. So that we have again more demand, more for more re, for more resources of which there are actually less. So. What do we do? Well, we're competing more, and you may think that's a uh, sort of contradiction in terms. How can a nonprofit compete? Well, think about it for a second. We compete for the best staff, right? We compete for the best board members, yeah. We certainly compete for donated dollars. Those of you, how many here are on staff or on boards of a nonprofit here in the area, right? Look around. Look, hold your hands up. Look around. That's your competition for donated dollars right there in the room, right? Right? So competition, we have been 
doing for many, many years, but we're more and more competing for services or for uh, uh, intellectual property or things that we hadn't competed with before. Um, and we are also competing with the for-profit world. Again, back way before some of you in the room were born, uh, all health care was provided by nonprofits. Then for-profit hospitals, for-profit rehab centers, for-profit uh, home health agencies came into the fold and began to compete. Uh, that competition is, is going to increase because the people that want the services provided, be they government or a uh, private enterprise or, or local communities, want the best service possible. And they don't care where they buy it from. They will buy it from the people that do the best service long term. Have there been problems with for-profits taking over not-for-profit service? Absolutely. Has it worked in every community? No, it has not. And there are legions of stories that uh, I can tell, and many of you probably know by heart, of this that hasn't worked. On the other hand, there are organizations that are doing social enterprise now, things like Tom Shoes and Two Degrees Bars and Sleeve Candy, that are doing, making money and doing social good as part of their core mission. I think that's very cool. I don't think that's a problem at all. Some people are worried about that as, as, as edging into our territory. I think it's all good. Um, but we can talk about that maybe in the Q&A a little later. Tech, 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 why? Because we're part of the world, and the world is tech, tech, tech. Uh, in, in all of my writings, I tell people in sort of the characteristics of successful nonprofits, one of them is that we must embrace technology for mission, and not accept technology, not put up with technology, not, uh, I guess we need Facebook, not that. We have to embrace technology for mission, or we leave two generations behind. Two generations of volunteers, two generations of donors, two generations of people to serve, right? They're gone. And so, like any other tool, I think we need to use the tool of technology just the way we use the tool of marketing and cash flow management and everything else to do good missions. Same thing with technology. Um, and that's only an acceleration. And lastly, and I think this is also a good thing, more accountability. We are stewards of public trust. If you're on a board or you're on a staff of a nonprofit, you are a steward of the resources of the community. They have temporarily entrusted you with those resources. And they have every right to come and say, what are you doing with our resources? Now, tech can help, because we can be transparent pretty quickly. But the accountability and what's your outcome and, and, and did you really have the effect you want and having to measure outcomes as opposed to just volume, right? Uh, that you, I don't know if any of you have read the, um, the wonderful book by Robert Edgar, or Edgar called uh, Begging for Change. It's about DC kitchens in Washington. And, and has Robert, where's Nick? Has Robert been here? Not yet. He should be. He's good. Um, he runs a, 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 a absolutely fabulous um, soup kitchen, uh, get people off a of welfare operation in Washington. And uh, one of the things he says in his book is, I can feed one person or a thousand people tonight. That's volume. Or, and, and, and I feel pretty good about myself. But really, if I feel, feed, feed the same person for a year, I've failed. That's outcome, right? And so he, he talks more about outcomes than volume and says we need to be much more concerned about accountability for outcome. Most of us think of accountability of did we have a good audit? OK, fine. But what did we do with the, with the community's money and trust and volunteer time, you know, time, talent, treasure that, that uh, benefits everybody? Okay, so a couple of philosophies and a couple of rules. Um, the philosophies come from my parents' dinner table. I, uh, I grew up uh, with parents who volunteered and started a, a large movement of nonprofits called the ARC, the Association of Retarded Citizens. And uh, my dad was an um, attorney and a, a, a civil engineer. My mom was a scientist. She worked on the Manhattan Project during World War II. And, uh, so there was no place in our house to hide from logic, ever, right? And so at dinner, when, when we talk about you know, the neighbors and talk about my poor math grades and stuff like that, at the dinner table, then we talk about nonprofit stuff, nonprofit stuff. And basically, these three things uh, came up over and over again. Matter of fact, when I started teaching, these show up on early in my slides pretty much everywhere I go. And my dad came to one of my sessions about five years in, and he said, you learned that at home. I said, yeah. And you teach it here? I go, yeah. Can I get part of your fee? No, you know, so, so. Okay, your nonprofit's a mission-based business, meaning that you're in the business of doing your mission. You are not a business. But if you don't ask business-like in your pursuit of mission, you won't be doing all the mission you can. 
The job of a steward is to get the most mission out the door every day with all the resources that you have. Now, an organization that thinks of itself as a charity, and again, technically, I know, you're all 501c3s, I get that. They think of themselves that we have four resources. And every, as a matter of fact, every 501c3 represented here has four resources. Some combination of money, people, buildings, and equipment. That's it. That's all you got, right? Well, if that's what we think is our limits, and we run out of those four things, the money, people, buildings, and equipment, we've got to go back and get more. We have to stop doing mission. We limit ourselves. If, however, we say, we're going to use the money, people, buildings, and equipment, plus we're going to get the best expertise in marketing, plus we're going to get the best expertise in technology, plus HR, plus inventory management, plus risk management, all that business stuff, to turn out the most best mission ever, then we're being a mission-based business. Okay, that's the idea. It is not to say profit rules. It doesn't. We'll talk about profit in a minute. First rule of nonprofit: always, always, always mission, mission, mission. Absolutely, that's the first rule. Second rule of nonprofits: very close to the first. No money, no mission, and that's where the business side helps us. And on your boards, you want a lot of skills, a lot of different skill sets, right? But you want about half people on your board who are passionate advocates for mission. They really, 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 really love your mission. And they push everybody on the board, everybody on the staff to mission, mission, mission. The other half of the board, you want business people. People who understand cash flow and profit and loss and all that stuff, right? And they, they, and they are not mission valueless. They're good people. But they keep you on to that no money, no mission thing. Keeps the organization in balance. You have that wonderful sort of dynamic tension on the board and on the staff, which is good. One of my friends on one of the boards I served on calls this stuff at a board meeting calls it vigorous fellowship, which is what you want, right? <laughs> Secondly, nobody gives you a dime. Nobody. Nobody, nobody, nobody. Who um, represents a local nonprofit here? Hand. Okay, so you're my victim. I mean my, I mean my case study, okay? Are you on the front row? What, and your name is? Kelly Bass. And Kelly, who do you represent? What, what organization? I'm the CEO of the Museum of Discovery right down the street. Museum of Discovery right down the street. Okay, so Kelly, once we're done tonight, hits me up for fundraising. He's got a capital fund drive going on or some new fund drive. You're right, you do, you absolutely do, right? Pretty much, if he's like most nonprofits, oh yeah, always raising money. And he gives me his best pitch. And I agree at the end of, the, of his pitch to give him money, I write him a check. This is hypothetical, I'm just telling you, okay. <laughs> so what's the transaction that occurs? Did I give Kelly a check? Some of you don't know what checks are, but they were little paper things we used to write to each other. Anyway, I, did I give him stuff personally? No. Did I give the Museum of Science and Discovery a, a gift? No. But Peter, you did. It's a tax exempt gift. You can take tax deductible next time you know, right? No. What really happened is I just purchased services for children and families in, in Arkansas who I will never meet. He made it so valuable to me with his pitch that I was willing to separate myself from my money because he gave me what the business community calls an expectation of outcome. When I bought my plane ticket to come out here, I gave US Air money in advance on the expectation of transportation. When I buy tickets to a concert, and John will eventually be selling tickets to his concerts, I expect, I will buy, I get it on the expectation of entertainment. When I give money to a charity, to a nonprofit, to a management-based business, I do it on the expectation of service. All right, he earns all his money. You earn all your money. Nonprofits earn all, all their money. No one, feds, states, local people, local United Way, county government, don't give you money, they buy stuff from you. Foundation send you $100,000 and say, have a nice year? No, they say, we want this, 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 this done, right? You're doing something for it. We earn all our money, really important. And lastly, the profit thing, <sighs> short, Part of this, there's no federal or state legislation that says that nonprofits can't make money. It does not exist. You have a tax exemption on what we call income tax. In truth, and we'll talk, we can talk about this in the Q&A if you want to, it's a profit tax exemption because businesses pay tax on profits. People pay taxes on income. Businesses pay tax on profits. Why do you need to make money? Well, I will tell you. Profit in a nonprofit is a good thing. Oh, no, that's wrong. That just, that's just wrong. No, it's not. Why? Okay, here's, here's my, my question for you. <clears throat> and I want hands on this. See all the exercise you're getting tonight? How many of you want your organization 
to do wonderful, amazing, fabulous mission all the rest of this fiscal year. Get your hands up. <laughs> of course you do. All right, now, you think out, next fiscal year, how many of you want to continue to do wonderful, awesome, amazing mission and do even more of it to serve more people? Okay, the first hand up, money enables mission. The second hand up, profit enables more mission. If you, as a not-for-profit organization, want to help more people, and of course you do, you can't do it without making money. You just can't. It's an irrevocable law of your balance sheet. When you grow, you soak up something called working capital, and the only place you can get it is from prior year's earnings or debt. Ooh, and if you take on debt, you have to pay it back through profits. That's how debt's paid back, right? So making money in a nonprofit, oh, bad thing. Not really. But is it an easy thing? No. Why? Well, everybody here, everybody here came to the nonprofit that they work with because they want to say yes. Yes, we can help you. Yes, we can feed you. Yes, we can clothe you. Yes, we can educate you. Yes, we can save you. Yes. And when you make money, you have to say at some point, no. No more. No more right now. No. And that's really hard. And that is an internal political decision that you can make or not make, whatever you want to do. But if you decide we're going to spend all the money we have every year because the people are so much in need, fine. But don't also try to grow because you can't, all right, because you will be out of business. And doing really well what you do at now with just the people you do now for just the people you do now, fine. But don't try to do both because you'll be out of money. I think most of us, we want to help everybody. So to do that, we have to make money. It's weird. It's strange. We thought we avoided that when we came to the nonprofit sector, but the rules of accounting followed us. <laughs> right? And so, and, and here we are, right? So, um, oh yeah, the other part about the profit thing is that not all services, <clears throat> I, well, let me put it, let's sit back. If I come and talk to your board, I'm going to say, you know, given what you're doing, give you a strategic plan, It'd probably be a good thing if you had a policy of trying to like make money if you're going to grow, right? It'd be very important. And, and making money in a nonprofit being a good thing does not have to need to be every part of your nonprofit. Some CEOs, nonprofit CEOs in the room? One, two, three, four, five, six, oh, nobody, the rest of them say, no, I'm not putting my hand up anymore. I'm done with that, right? If I ask the CEOs in the room whether their organization made money or lost money, they'd give me an answer and they'd be right 100% of the time. If I asked them which of the programs they did, made or lost money, they'd give me an answer. And about half the time, they'd be wrong. Because of what's, what's called cost shifting. For those of you that haven't done nonprofit funding, this foundation says I want to pay for this and this and this and that purse, but not that coat and this. You know, we do all this weird stuff to make our funders happy. And we do what's called cost shifting. So we don't really know where we make or lose money. Cost shifting is another term for self-delusion. <laughs> right? So we don't really know. Well, what I care about is whether your different programs make money or lose money. And I, please hear me say this. If you want to do something in the community and lose money at it, good for you. But do it because nobody else is doing it. Do it because nobody will pay for it. Do it because nobody else is doing it well and the community needs it. If you want to lose money doing that, fine. Good for you. But if that's all you do, Bye-bye. Right? So you have to make a decision. And in a for-profit world, when we buy this computer in the for-profit world, what we're concerned about is the return on investment financially. In the nonprofit world, we buy this computer, we better be concerned about the for-profit or the, the return on investment financially too, but we also have to be concerned with the mission value. So if I have a high mission return, I can have a low money return. Anybody here do soup kitchen, uh, food for the poor, food for the hung hungry? Anybody here? Okay. Think about that. Hugely high mission. Feed hungry people? Woo! Pretty, pretty mission rich, right? Very mission rich. You make any money at it? Nope. Should you be a soup kitchen? I don't know. Maybe. Do you make good soup? You shouldn't inflict bad food on poor people because you feel guilty. Okay, I'm just saying that. All right? Just saying. So. Be, doing high mission, low money, perfectly good thing to do. Most nonprofits also do a service, invest money in a service that does no mission. Does no mission. Does anybody know what it is? 
It's what Kent was doing. It's fundraising. <gasps> right? It's fundraising does no mission unless what? It makes money. So that service is weighed on this scale of doesn't do any mission, so better make money. You see what I'm saying? High mission, low money, low mission, high money, or balance. Ooh, what would be nice? High mission, high money. That'd be cool, too. But overall, what you want to do is get to a place where you can fund your growth, and the only way you can do that is through organizational profit most years. And again, if that makes you uncomfortable ethically, because people have too many needs now, good for you. Just don't grow. Just don't grow, because you'll be broke otherwise. Okay? This is the, basically that thing. I'm going to walk over here. I'm going to get the person on the video camera upset. This is low, low, don't do this. Low money, low mission, not a good idea, right? This is a uh, uh, high mission return. People in academia like me love two by twos. We love these kind of, kind of charts, these are fun. Uh, if, you, if, you're in the, if you're good at it, do it. If you make good soup, you can do this. If you make good soup, you can do that. If you do this, oh, high money, high mission, we should definitely do that. No, only if you're good at it, and only if it's something that you consider what we call a core competency. The people you serve don't deserve to be served adequately. They deserve to be served well. And we sometimes hmm, don't quite make that, make that threshold, at least every single time, right? Um, OK, before I get to this slide, I want, I want to say one more thing. About, actually, I'm going to go back one slide, because that's the easiest way to talk about this. <sighs> Fundraising, no mission. I know, I know, I know. There's some fundraising, like the Heart Association, right? We all go out for our 10K walk, and we help our hearts, and that helps our mission while we raise money. I get that. But most of us in fundraising is in, fundraising is an enabler, right? It's an enabler of good mission. <clears throat> Pretty much every year, as I get on the road, as you might imagine, a lot, um, in the States and in Australia a lot, and in South America and Europe a lot, and I have the same conversation everywhere. And it basically, here's the conversation. Some board member walks up to me after I do a community event, and they say this, wow, thanks for coming. That was really fun. I really liked hearing all that. I wish you'd been here last week, because if you had been here last week, you could have come to our annual chicken supper. And I like chicken suppers, you know, right? So I always say, that'd be nice. I'm sorry I missed it. So what do you have your chicken supper for? Is it like networking or fundraising? Oh, it's our annual fundraiser. Oh, cool, how'd you do? Well, says the board member, we measure everything now. Ever since I've been on the board, we've started to measure. We measure, 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 measure. Good. How much money did you make? This year, um, $633. At this point, I go, right? Because I have to ask the next question, which is, and how many board and staff hours went into that 633? Oh, we measured that too. This year, it was 940 hours. And so this is your first chicken supper. No, this is our 20th anniversary, right? <clears throat> this is always described as a fundraiser. This is a fund loser. Now, everybody hear me here, right? Fried chicken, good. Let's start with that. Let's not deal with the nutrition, right? Community networking, good. Getting people together, good. Fellowship, good. All that's good. But if it's described as a fundraiser, these people for 20 years have shown that they are no good at making money selling chicken. This is bad stewardship, because every one of those staff people, every one of those board people have the same number of hours in their day that you have in yours. Right? OK, so take that with you. Chicken suppers, taco dinners. I don't care. Right? It's the same stuff. Right? OK, last thing before, before I, I, I leave you is, is this. If you are making decisions, if you're making decisions, when you make decisions about anything in your organization, you have to have one or more of these four outcomes. This is the point. So as a board, as a staff, as a committee, whether you're fundraising or hiring or buying technology or expanding services or sending people to school, more mission, better mission, more efficient mission, more effective mission. Because your mission is your most valuable asset. It is why people show up. It is why people give you money. It is why the enthusiasm for your organization exists. And if you waste that mission by just putting it on the wall and not talking about it all the time, you will lose the most important asset you have. This is the outcomes that you need, is this more and more and more and more. But it's all wrapped around the issue of my mission rules. Now. If I come tell you my mission, or if I asked poor Ken, I wouldn't do this to him, about what his mission is, and he would tell us, 
and it'd be awesome. And about halfway through, we'd go, click. Right? Particularly if you told us, tell me more about your mission. Click. No, 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 not because it's short. But the way I would hear, if, if Kent could tell me one story about one kid who came into his museum, I'm in. Tell your mission through story. Learn your mission stories. You have millions of them. And tell your mission, well, yeah, I've had to recite it. Yeah, that's good. On your application, you have to recite it. But if you're talking to people and making friends and raising money, tell them your stories. All right? It's all about mission first. Don't forget that money is the enabler, right? And John asked me, why do I, why do I stay just in the nonprofit world, not work for for profits? I said, because I love the people. I love what you're doing. I love to talk to you about the amazing things that you're doing for your community. So good for you, and thank you for what you do for this community, and keep doing what you're doing. And I think we have time for questions now. Is that true? That is. Good. Okay. So thank you. Thanks, Peter. Let's, uh, let's, we do have some time for some questions, so if uh, you would raise your hands, uh, we'll get the microphone to you. Yes, right here. Let's wait for the mic. Well, oh, you got two mics? Two you can, mic. have, you can have a, both mics. It's the this. dueling mics. One might be enough. Mr. Brinkerhoff, I'm Oh, I'm please. That's at. my father. Call me Peter. Okay. Peter? Yeah. I'm Scott Stewart. Hi, Scott. I've been involved in a, involved in a high-mission, low-money effort as a professional for a while, trying to help nonprofits invest their money for the long term, mm -hmm. uh, or even for the short term in the, in the form of reserve funds or emergency funds, and the long term in the form of endowments and other investments. Mm -hmm. And I'm uh, not having any success, although I am talking to people. Mm -hmm. You mind commenting on that, please? We'll pray for you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Well, first, to all the nonprofits here, despite the um, domestic prejudice against endowments from funders, from individuals, right? I want money for my, you have an endowment? Why do you charge me admission, right? Yeah, I mean, really, you know, right? Why do you charge me? And, and, and the differentiation is universities and healthcare. They have endowments, all good. Boys Clubs has an endowment, what is going on? That's wrong, right? So there's that prejudice there, okay? <clears throat> the, second part, the second part about it is the, the significant and standard underfunding of resources from particularly government uh, uh, grantors who often have a rule that if you don't spend it, you must give it back, right? Uh, a lot of government funders, and I work with a lot of government foundation on this, and I'm making, I've been at it for 30 years, and I've failed to say, you're buying services, not buying organizations. And when they give you 5% of your income, they think they own you. Uh, and you got to give it back, right? I mean, really, think about this. Think about this. Somebody from the state of Arkansas, or somebody from some large foundation that funds people here in Arkansas, or organizations here in Arkansas, <clears throat> calls up, I'll pick on Kent again, calls up Kent and says, he says, I want 150 units of service of something that, that the, the museum does. And Kent goes, well, here my, here's my price. And they go, oh, no, 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 how much cost? So that's less. And then he gets done with that, and the, and the funder says, or the university says, uh, or the uh, foundation says, I'll fund you 80% of your cost. You go make up the difference, right? So now, instead of being a science wonder, an educator wonder, he has to also turn into a fundraiser, right? Which is dumb, not that he can't be a fundraiser, but it's just like, that's not the skill set, right? You wanna be good at everything you do, right? And the university, or the, the, the government or the foundation isn't willing to pay full price for what he does. Right? Now. They hang up on Kent, who's sitting there going, that's wonderful, we got 80%, I gotta go raise money. They called Dell Computer back in the days when we actually made computers, right, or they call Apple. I wanna buy 45 laptops. And um, Apple says, well, here's our price. And the, the government, can you imagine the government saying, no, give me your cost and I'll only pay you 80% of it? They'd never do that. For a nonprofit, that's perfectly acceptable. For a for-profit, it's not acceptable at all, in the same breath. Right? It's nuts, which leads us to being underfunded and the idea of putting money away. Right? <laughs> and the other part about this is that putting money away in hard times when there are so many needs is a very difficult political pill for any board to solve, to swallow. Now, having said that, I believe every nonprofit needs an endowment. I believe for those of you who are fundraisers, it differentiates the gift. So Kent comes to me as he did and gives me a pitch for his operating campaign. That's what you raised money for, right? Say yes. Perfect, okay. And I give to him out of this pocket. 
But he later comes to me and says, give me the gift that keeps on giving, that endowment gift. I give to him out of this pocket. Or maybe I'm interested in that, but I'm not interested in the operations. I think it's a, it's a valuable differentiation in the fundraising market, right? And you can have an endowment. Anybody can have an endowment that's a nonprofit. You can have it as a reserve. You can have, well, you can, there's a billion different ways to, to, to uh, as you know better than I do, to uh, uh, process it. But not having one makes you always living hand to mouth. Some of you had the privilege, of, uh, uh, as I have, of working with homeless people. And when you work with homeless people, it's really, really, really hard to get them to think about a year from now. They're thinking about now. How do I feed my kids? Where do I sleep tonight? How do I do that? It's very difficult to see the future if you're living hand to mouth. We as non-for-profits, if we make ourselves live hand to mouth by not ever having any reserves, it's very difficult for us to think strategically too. Right? Very, very hard. So. Those are the arguments I would make. I'm sure the arguments you have made. Um, maybe you want to talk about some success stories in, in, in the nonprofit world, like Goodwills and other organizations that have been able to do this. It's, it's a hard sell. It's a very hard sell with the community. So, Sandy, we have a question right here. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Sydney Shear. I'm a student at the Clinton School. I was wondering, um, given how competitive it is for nonprofits to fundraise and get mm -hmm. grants and how little government funding there is, if you see a place for collaboration among nonprofits? Oh, sure. Oh, sure. Yeah. But in collab, I've done, I don't know, a couple hundred mergers with nonprofits over the years. Um, well, let me, let, me, let me step back. Collaboration. Your nonprofit, my nonprofit, going in for a grant together, doing some collaboration. All, usually all good. Usually. What's your part? What's our part? We split the money. We split the okay. um, Collaboration. You and I can't afford a tech person full time, so we hire one and we share that person full time. Usually okay, except when your tech breaks and my tech breaks the same day, we both want the person. Now you see a lot of this with HR, which is like, really? We really, you're going to pay attention to my HR problems when somebody else at the other place has a, a wrongful discharge lawsuit? You really are? Really? Really? You know, that, I mean, that's, that's the, the, the next kind of problem. And then we get into the merger part. And in merger, in some cases in nonprofits, there are economies of scale. But I will tell you that every single board, every single one I talk to in um, mergers, all start with the same thing when I say, what do you want as the outcome? Well, we don't want to lose any staff. Well, 90% of your expenses are employees, you know, right? And so if we're going to make this an economy of scale and make it more efficient, somebody, you, don't, you don't need two financial officers. You don't need two HR, you know, right? So that kind of thing. So that, the, the experience record on mergers for nonprofits is not very good. Okay, it doesn't mean it can't work. It doesn't mean it doesn't work in some cases. It really does. Um, but it's really, really difficult because usually you're merging two cultures, usually you're merging two missions, usually. If you are merging within the same franchise, like two Red Crosses, two Easter Seals, two Girl Scouts, much easier because you start basically aligned in what you're doing. But across missions, it's, it's hard. It's a great question, but it's just, it's just dude, it, 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 our track record is not very good. Wish it was better. Oh, and by the way, let me, let me flip your question around because I inferred from your questions. Isn't this great? I get up here with my, I can say anything I want. I infer from, from a question that, that uh, Cindy's question that, that merger means better service, maybe, maybe not, but that that will make for less nonprofits and that's a good thing. And her question, I get from funders all the time, really what we need is less nonprofits. No, we don't. If anybody tells you that, anybody tells you that, anybody tells you that, say, okay, can you tell me who's going to be the next Habitat? Can you tell me who's going to be the next Kiva? Can you tell me who's going to be the next Ronald McDonald House? Can you? Can you? Because then you know for these five applications that which one shouldn't come up. But you can't tell that. You can't say that at all. 25 years ago in Atlanta, I told this story a couple times today already, Atlanta Community Foundation, a bunch of housing um, uh, found foundations about housing, got an application from Habitat, who nobody knew. And most of the funding people turned them down because it was a dumb idea, right? And they asked an expert on housing, all of whom said, this is a dumb idea. Nobody's going to be able to build suitable housing with volunteers. What a dumb idea. And the Community Foundation took a, took a flyer 
on this little group called Habitat. Mm. Will some not-for-profits fail? Sure. And many of you in the room I know object to the new nonprofits in your community. Don't. What do they do? They make you better because they make you run faster. Right? Think of you're in second grade, you're lining up to go to go to line up for the bell after recess, and you run into the lineup. That was in the days when I could run. Run to the lineup, right? And you run as fast as you can until your friend runs up next to you and says, I'll beat you to the door, and then you run faster. Right? Competition for us is hard for us as staff and board, but it's good for the people we serve. Which, oh yeah, is the point. So when people say we have too many nonprofits, how do you know? Really? Well, there's too much competition for funding. How do you know? And how do you know who the next breakout people are going to be? So, see, I took your great question and made it worse. But anyway, yeah, thank we have you. a question right here. Yeah. Yeah, this, this is really good. Uh, I've got a couple of small nonprofits that are more educational. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we've struggled with is measurability yep. in addition to accountability. Yep. Yep. Do you have any guidance in how to, to sell the need for that? And what are the, the best steps for coming up with something that, that is usable? Um, the best book on this and the best resource on this is a guy named Jason Saul in, in Chicago. And his book is called Benchmarking for Nonprofits. Jason's a great guy. He's done absolutely fabulous work with this with most of the big national foundations. Um, th there is, is no question in those of you that aspire to larger organization funding, this is a deal killer if you can't begin to talk about outcomes. Now, let's talk about recidivism. Let's talk about public education. Talk about education, right? What makes a great school? Oh, I think it must be better teachers. Oh, it must be students paying more attention. Oh, it must be better technology. Oh, it must be the income level of the family or the family parental involvement or, 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 or. And all of us deal with one part of that. And so for us to show positive outcome in school if the parents aren't involved, very hard. For us to show positive outcome in school if, there's, if the school doesn't have access to, in these days, technology, to, you know, the standards of learning and stuff. So we can hide behind this is hard to measure. But there are ways to get at it. There are ways to begin to measure just about everything. Now, I'm not saying everything is measurable, but just about everything. And Jason has some really good metrics and really good ways to do that. So um, uh, benchmarking for nonprofits, Jason Saul, S-A-U-L. He does terrific work. And, and this is something that all of you, if you aren't already doing it, need to be. And we had outcome measures at the beginning 10, 15 years ago. It, we, we just measured activity, right? And we need to get deeper on that. And we need to figure out, what do we want to measure? What's really the point of what we do? You know, is it uh, people uh, uh, matriculating to the University of Arkansas? Or is it people being able to pass the standards of learning? Or is it people being able to read? You know, I, where, where are we going with what we do? Um, so uh, set those, those reasonable expectations. I want to thank Karen Aaron from the Ronald McDonald House Charities, who was very helpful in getting and bringing Peter here. So Karen, thank she you. She bribed me. So. She, she, no, she's a longtime friend of mine, and we appreciate that. <laughs> Let's give Peter a round of applause, and then you. Uh, you all can visit with him after. Peter, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.